okay, so here we go, I guess. My friend James, if you are watching this, and I hope that you are because I'm making this literally just for you, um, it's on your question, and I'm going to read it so that I can, I'm going to pull it up so I can have it and remind myself so I can answer these because I have the same question um, in class, actually. So does the Bible actually say God is perfect? Does, does the Bible ever say does the Bible ever say that God is perfect or that he is infallible? Um, what does the Bible actually say about who God is? So I think that I think I know where you're coming from because I also think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that what you're what you're getting at is that our modern conceptions, especially Western modern conceptions of what God is like, revolves heavily around this idea of an ultimate being. And that comes like the things that come with that are actually very restrictive. We don't think of an ultimate being as having lots of restrictions, but there kind of are right. Timelessness, um, omnipresence, lots of just a ton of things that that like normal people don't have. In fact, the ability to not make mistakes, right? Like no mistakes allowed. God is perfect. Like all of those things are really. They really put God in a box, and I've talked about putting God in a box before. Um, that may not be your issue. You might just be asking, like, how do we know we're not making God bigger than he actually is in the Bible? Uh, which is, by itself, a pretty heretical thing to ask, right? Like, that sounds that sounds like you're saying, how dare you imply that God could be anything less than that? He's God, right? And that right there, um, I'm going to go ahead and answer with just a simple Bible verse, right? Is there, like, does the Bible say anything pertaining to God being perfect? And the answer is yes, kind of. So 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10 is, is full of um, some imagery about what God is supposed to be like. And one of those things is that God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted, etc. Um, this idea of, of all knowing. But there's also um, other passages like 1 John 1, 5 that say that the message we have heard from him and declare to you God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. So there are some value statements being made about God and what he's capable of. Um, as you know, I don't prefer referring to God as God. I prefer referring to him by the name Yahweh, just so that there's no confusion. Um, and also because I don't subscribe to the idea that Yahweh is a deity, right? Yahweh is more than a deity. But that's neither here nor there. Um, there is a passage that says specifically that God is perfect. Um, and that's specifically in Matthew 5. Matthew 5, 48 says that Jesus... So Jesus apparently is recorded as having said that his father who is in heaven is perfect and therefore we should be perfect also. The really interesting thing about that is that this is the closest, this is the only passage we have in scripture that gets anywhere close to saying, and it's pretty blatant, right? Be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Here's where the issue comes up for that Bible verse. Christians all around the board argue as to whether or not that word perfect means perfect. Just like we're in some places, the Bible, it says condemn versus judge. Don't judge others lest you be also judged. Some people say, well, is it judge or is it condemn? Don't condemn others. Um, the same thing happens here with this word perfect. It's really easy to look at this passage and say, there you go. God is perfect. Um, but then you read other passages that say, well, you need to be perfect also. Just like, well, actually, this one <laughs> exactly says you need to be perfect. Um, or another one where, where it says that if your faith is imperfect, then God doesn't is not pleased. And what, what does perfect mean? Um, the idea is that you and I need to be perfect before we can enter into the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? What what is it like? I have to be perfect to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Does that does that implicate that I have to be infallible? That I don't commit sins? That I don't make mistakes? What does what does that mean, right? And so a lot of people have chosen to interpret the word perfect there, uh, telos in the Greek, as being complete. So God is complete. He is self subsistent, and we need to be complete. We need to be whole, just as God is whole, right? That's another way of looking at that. So the line there is a little blurry. Is God actually perfect? And this is uh, this is definitely like one of those you can't say that in church moments because how dare you say God is not perfect? God is the ultimate being. That's what makes him God, right? He's not God if he's not perfect. And that is exactly what we talked about this week in class. The ideas of of um, essential theology, not not like theology, like doctrines and whatnot, but like the study of what is God, what is theos, what is deism, is really today, and especially in, in, in U.S. Christianity, I can't speak for anywhere else, but like I know for a fact here that it is completely and solely based 
on platonic ideas of an ultimate being. Okay, so you, you're probably familiar with this, but just in case anybody else in the chat is listening or anybody on YouTube happens to stumble across. Hi, I'm Eli. I'm a pastor and I current, I'm currently in seminary, so I'm learning a lot about theology, whether I want to or not. Um, but I've also practiced as a pastor for, for a number of years, maybe not very many. Um, but I'm, I'm deeply passionate about learning about stuff like this and, and really pushing the envelope on our understanding of God, because I think that we put him in too restrictive a box. I believe Yahweh is bigger than that. So Plato, philosopher from the 5th century BC, or BCE if you prefer, um, he was kind of a big deal. Like he, he was such a big deal that he's probably the most well-preserved ancient author from Greco-Roman time um, in any of our of archives. The, the person who comes second closest is Aristotle, and we're missing a lot of work from him. But Plato, we even have stuff misattributed to him. He's nowhere near the same level of, of documentation and, and archival material as the New Testament, where we have just copies upon copies of manuscripts of people who supposedly copied down everything that's that was transmitted during the early church. So Plato's important because his ideas about reality and metaphysics really, really defined for a lot of people how they view theology and metaphysics. And even today, you're going to see it's everything you see and you think about God is probably platonic. And who was that instituted by? Well, none other than the Roman Catholic Church. Um, they they took a lot of these ideas, especially Augustine. Thank you, Augustine. Thanks so much. I hate you. Um, and just just attributed all of these understandings onto Yahweh as an ultimate being. So what do I mean by an ultimate being? An ultimate being for Plato is someone who is not corruptible by time or by space. Because for him, time and space, the material is no bueno, right? No good. If it, if it exists in time and space, there's no way that it can ever become its true self. Just basic platonic dualism, um, which for Christ, for Adventist Christians, like we recognize that instantly and we fight back against platonic dualism by saying like, no, there is no separation between um, the body and the soul. There's no timeless part of you. You're all one being. You're all one soul, right? And modern Christianity isn't like that. And it started with... with um, with early Christian church through through the Catholic Church when it was the only church, um, a lot of thinkers like Augustine really really thought that, and maybe Augustine isn't precisely the person I should be blaming, but he's an easy target. Um, a lot of early church fathers just really thought that the body and the soul they were like separate things, and they borrowed a lot from Platonic dualism to to back that up instead of backing themselves up in the Bible. Which, you know, if you're the Catholic Church, you believe in. Uh, in the authority of of tradition and the word of God, and the word of God is also what the church teaches, and I can't I can't argue with that. That's your theology. That's the way that it is. For Protestants, we say no. The word of God is only in the canonical scriptures. You know that that's its own own can of worms. Well, Plato, the ultimate being, right? What what is the ultimate being? For Plato, an ultimate being is someone who is perfect, who is infallible, impassable. Um, they are omnipresent. They are all knowing. They are all powerful. They that's all of those things should sound really familiar. That's exactly how we describe God. We, we describe Yahweh this way. Well, he called this ultimate being Theos, God. When we, when we talk about God today, the word G-O-D, we are making reference inevitably to the Theos, T-H-E-O-S, that Plato was talking about. And that description that Plato came up with was revolutionary, okay? What I'm saying is, People didn't think about God that way. Like, they didn't think gods, deities, were this ultimate being. No one was making that claim. Nobody in the Old Testament was making that claim. Nobody in the New Testament was making that claim. None of the pagan religions made a claim that their, God, that their Theos, that their Elohim, were ultimate beings. None of them were. It's not until Plato shows up that he makes this claim. And there's a special reason why he makes this claim. Because Plato believed um, in... Or rather, he didn't believe. That's the whole, that's his whole shtick, is he's fighting, he's pushing back against a, a system of belief that held a pantheon in, in, in the human mind, um, that the gods, that the Theos, were a bunch of super, they were basically the Avengers, okay? And I'm not kidding you, like, the way that we have the Avengers today is kind of how they had the Pantheon back then. And in fact, sometimes I wonder, like, how do we know they really believed in them? How do we know they didn't, weren't just like, they weren't just like big fans of Zeus? You know what I'm saying? 
who knows? Maybe that's not making sense, and I'm probably losing a lot of you in the audience right now. But what's important to know is that the ancient Greek gods and lots of pagan gods were, bas were basically petty. They got into fights with each other, they squambled, they, they, they squandered their resources, they had sex with a lot of people, with a lot of other gods, and with a lot of humans. They came down to Earth just for the fun of it, and they had grudges, and they did revenge, and in fact the entire Odyssey is based around this idea that Poseidon is really upset with Ulysses, or with, um... Yeah, Ulysses, what's, what's the other name for him? Um, Odysseus? Is it Odysseus? Yeah, the Odyssey, right? Oh boy. It's been a while. Um, that guy, the the guy who fought in the Trojan War, and then he comes back and he gets stuck and he's going through um, the sea and there's sea monsters and everything. It's all because he made Poseidon upset. He made a big no-no and Poseidon is punishing him by sending waves and crashing him and shipwrecking him. All of those things. And he's trying to get home. And he can't make it home because his wife is over there and he can't because he's stuck on the ship. Th that guy, right? Those type, Those conceptions of Theos are the things that Plato is criticizing. So Plato isn't so much believing in something as much as he is saying, there's no way those guys are gods. In my opinion, a real god would be somebody who is an ultimate being. How can these guys be so powerful? I'm, I don't think these deific beings are deific enough. In my, remember, this is Plato's ideas. In, in Plato's mind, he's like, if something is worth worshiping, then it needs to be an ultimate being. And today, 2,500 years later, it's like 2,400, right? 2,400 years later, Western Christianity, and I think Christianity as a whole, and especially Islam, like, we've all picked up on it. We've all picked up the torch, and we've grabbed platonic ideas of Theos and just run with them. And then we apply them back into scripture when they were not present in there. And that, I think, is a big problem. Because we can't have meaningful discussions about identifying the personality of God if we believe God is timeless, if we believe he is... Uh, well, hold on. I don't believe... That God can't experience time. Like, ah, see, there it is. We all know deep down inside that those things can't be true, especially because the Bible is full of references to how, quite frankly, God is a lot more passable than Plato thought that he was. Forgive me. Yahweh is very different from the ultimate being that Plato is describing. This is going to offend a lot of people because you can probably imagine. Um, <laughs> Christians have subscribed to the idea that Yahweh is a platonic theos, an ultimate being. And for them, who they are worshiping, and who many of the Christians today are worshiping, we're really worshiping a platonic theos, an ultimate being. And we have surrendered to the idea of a platonic ultimate being. That's who we imagine that Yahweh is. Is he? Maybe. Like, I, I, I personally don't see why Yahweh can't be. In, in some senses, right? I, I would argue that Pl Plato and his ultimate being is still too limited for me. Like, he really puts Plato way out there. He was more of a deist, someone who believed that there existed a, an ultimate being somewhere, but he's uninterested in us. That was his whole thing. Like, real gods would never be interested in us. None of this Zeus and Athena nonsense and Hera and, and then demigods like Heracles. Those, those were his ideas. He was fighting back against that. Is it fair then to take that reactionary theology and apply it back into Yahweh? Probably not. Let's, let's give people the benefit of the doubt, though. Let's say that they indeed, let's say that indeed God is possibly a, an omnipresent, eternal, um, omnipotent, and all-knowing being, right? Or as I like to call him, an extra-dimensional granddaddy. Oh, maybe not a granddaddy because he doesn't have a... He doesn't have grandchildren, but an extra dimensional papa, right? He he creates everything and he is everywhere and he but but be careful because he can't exactly be everywhere, otherwise it's pantheism, right? We've had that discussion. Well, let's say that 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 the Bible is maybe the Bible let's say that that is actually what Yahweh is. The Bible doesn't necessarily reveal Yahweh to be that in the Old Testament, right? I mean, we have first Samuel where it's Samuel literally arguing with Yahweh about why picking Saul as the king was a bad idea. And Yahweh says, I know, I messed up, this was a bad idea. If you don't believe me, let us <laughs> let me go ahead and pull that right up, right? Um, uh, 
Yahweh and Samuel argue over Saul. That's 1 Samuel 15, verse 17. Let me put that up on the screen right now, because I can do that now. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, what am I... Here we go. Okay. So, um, this right here. This is 1 Samuel 15, 17. Let me go to, to a non-heretical version of the Bible, because nobody likes the... Uh, the NIV, ah, oh, there we go, the King James Bible. That makes me feel nice and warm inside. Lord rejects Saul as king. Samuel said to Saul, etc., etc. So Saul summoned. Saul attacked the Amalekites. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out against Yahweh all night long. Oops, I'm a little too, there we go. All night long. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. So when, Saul, when Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Right. So we, we have a little bit of this, uh, this anger with Samuel. And there are other places where Samuel um, cries out against Yahweh. And he says, I, I really don't appreciate that you completely ignored my advice. On the, right. Samuel has a perception of what is right. And he's having this interplay with Yahweh. Now, from a platonic perspective, it requires us to reinterpret that. We cannot take that as a surface level reading, right? You see the problem now. If we take platonic ideas of, of an ultimate being, we have to eisegete the passages, which, hey, join the eisegesis party. I don't think it's that bad. But again, most Christians and most Adventists especially say, no, 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 eisegesis is super bad, right? So there you go. Don't eisegete this passage. Take it exactly as it reads. Do you still have an ultimate being? Not in the way that Plato said. Plato doesn't allow for something like this. So the only solution here is what the Catholic Church has done, which is to create what's called intermediaries. Something that can that can exist in a passable, time-bound, time and space uh, uh, way that doesn't violate the rules of an ultimate being. So what the Catholic Church has done is actually super, super creative. You have the timeless God, Perfect, immutable, um, impassable. Impassable means that they don't experience emotions. They are constant. They are the eternal, non-entropic, ultimate being. Okay? So that can't interact very well, right? So, th so they created like a little bit of a workaround. And so they created things like um, the word, the living word uh, the in the flesh, which is the Logos, which is Jesus. We have Mary being an intermediary. Um, we have the angels being intermediary, something that goes in between the tangible and the non-tangible, the physical and the non and the metaphysical. And that's really creative, right? Like that, that then reinterprets passages like these. It's it appears that God is is passable, but he's not. He's not really changing his mind. He always meant it to be that way. It's just that he's like, you know, 16 dimensional chess, five steps ahead, and and Samuel is really talking to a projection of what God wants him to see. And that's the that's what Samuel was ready to experience. That's how we interpret that with this platonic ultimate being lens. And that irks me. That irks me so bad. Because, well, I don't know. What do you think? Is it fair for us to come back and then reinterpret all of these Old Testament texts as being, well, God revealed himself that way back then because that's, well, you know, like, well, he not really that. Like, we can't take that person, that verse, like, literally. Because, okay, fine. I'm willing to play that game. But you have to be willing to play with me and say, we are allowed to reinterpret some of these passages in the way that that is relevant to us today. If you're not willing to play that game, we're also not willing we're also not allowed to then go back and reread re platonic ultimatism onto these texts. It's just that is not I'm not willing to play that game. That's not where I'm at. So, James, hopefully that answers the first part of your question. The the second part of your question I think is a lot quicker to answer. Um which lads might say, well, he gave us free will, so could he make oh, come on. There we go. He gave us free will so we could make that choice, the choice to believe in here, him, right? Um, and you'd say, then, does God not have the free will? Because if he were originally, if we were an original clone or a copy of the perfection of God and still made a mistake, to me, that implies that God can make mistakes. I love that question or, or that assertion because it's the same one that Taves made. Oh, man, Dr. Taves... 
I never thought I'd be praising that man like so hard simping for that guy after after college. But man, Dr. Taves, it just gets better and better. I love Dr. Holdsworth still sp holds a special place in my heart. But like in here, Dr. Taves lives rent free in my brain because he asked questions like this in our theology class. He said, OK, so what was at stake at the cross? And, and we're like, what? He's like, yeah, what was at stake? What, what were the stakes? This ties, ties directly into this type of question that James is asking. If God couldn't fail, were there any stakes? Think about that. This is a really fun, tricky question for Christians who believe in an ultimate God and who are unwilling to accept that God is very capable of not good right? A platonic being is not capable, a platonic ultimate being not capable of not good, okay? They can only do good and everything they do is good by virtue of them doing it. Which, from a logical consistency point of view, that's really appealing to me. I like that. That's very well played, Plato. I'll, I'll give you a slow clap. However, what is actually at stake? And I think it was Jafia. I don't remember. Jafia, if you're watching this, I love you, man. I can't wait to, to actually meet up with you one of these days. Um, I think it was Jafia said, well, like, like the whole universe was waiting to see if God wouldn't, right? And, <laughs> and Tave says, but did God ever worry? Like, was God, was there ever any worry that Jesus wasn't going to go through with this? Was it ever really an issue? And that really caught us off guard, right? Because we're, we knew immediately the tension there. If we say yes, there was there was something at stake, then we're implying that God is not is not perfect in the classical platonic sense. Like he's capable of wrong. And that was scary. I still remember like feeling like like something inside of me didn't like that. I was like, oh man, that's not good. I don't like this question, but I loved it at the same time. If I say yes, there was something at stake, well now I've stepped into the unknown. Unknown at least for our Christian uh, our Christian understand, our Western Christian understandings of modern day theism. Um, so I invite you to take that step with me. I've taken that step a long time ago and, and I have chosen personally to believe that God will do good while at the same time accepting that he is perfectly capable of doing, that it is well within his power to do anything he wants and that I may not disagree with it, but I'm choosing to believe. That's, that's what I believe faith is, is choosing to believe that God will continue to, to be faithful. Um, and I think that's the grand narrative throughout, throughout scripture isn't about a God who can't make mistakes. Um, I'm not implying that God has made mistakes. I think that's up for debate. I think that's an interesting question on its own right. But what I'm saying is if, if we really were made in God's image and if we're that close to being much like God, much like the rest of the created beings who have not fallen, would we say that none of those other fallen beings couldn't fall? I would say they can. They always will be able to. But that's, again, buying into this into this hidden premise in, in some of your questions, is free will actually existent? And if, if I were to say, yes, God has... If I'm not a Calvinist, which I, I don't, I've got a lot of problems with Calvinists, but I think a lot of their arguments are really, really compelling. Um, again, they're really stuck on Platonic, though, Pl Platonism. So... And they're going to say, no, no, we're not. Yes, you are. Just, it's okay. Like, you're not a sinner for believing in platonic ideas of an ultimate being. You're a sinner by birth. Uh, <laughs> those of you who got that reference, just drop, drop an amen in the chat. Um, yeah, it would seem so. It seems that God is perfectly capable of wrongdoing, and yet he chooses not to. And that's why I worship him, is because I choose to believe that he won't. I choose to believe that he'll be faithful. If you, if you don't get to choose to believe, is it really faith or is it just a matter of fact? A lot of Christians, I think, are stuck on trying to make believing in God a matter of fact, a, a evidence-based thing. But the reality is that faith is really a conscious choice to believe. There's no way around that. There are no ifs, ands, or buts. That is what faith is. And you can't convince me otherwise unless you show me from the Bible or with plain reason that, that, that that's somehow just plainly a misconception. James, I hope you're doing super well. I miss you. I miss seeing Ellen, and I miss the rest of the of the uh, flex trek, flex right in the streets <laughs> chat. Uh, Gabriel, if you're watching this, I love you, man. Hugs to you and Morgan. Um, hello to the rest of you, um, Jesse and Carter, 
whom I only met like twice. And Austin, of course, you hold a special place in my heart. Praying for you always, buddy. And I love seeing your progress in Muay Thai. Um, who else? Yeah. Jinji, I hardly ever see you on the chat anymore. So if you, if you watch this for whatever reason, awesome. But other than that, guys, I hope this has been at the very least insightful um, because it was exciting to me. I got in trouble for asking class, like, how do we know that this platonic ideal is what, what the Old Testament believers understood about Yahweh? And the response from the rest of the class was kind of antagonistic. But the professor actually kind of sided with me. He's like, yeah, this is, this is very clearly instituted by the Catholic Church. And we're still dealing with it today. That's what Christians today believe. But it's not necessarily, we're, we're, I'm not convinced entirely that this is necessarily what the Bible teaches. So we need to be completely, perfectly crystal clear that these ideas of an ultimate being are propagated by Plato. And maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. And that's that's where, where I think the danger comes in. So uh, the TLDR for James, if you just decided to scrub all the way to the end, hey there. Uh, the short answer is, yeah, big heresy, big PP, 10 out of 10, next meme.